Good evening, everybody. Hello. I'm Jen Bernardi, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum. Before we begin, I have just a few uh, housekeeping announcements. This event, as always, is being recorded and it will be available free to subscribers on Comcast Xfinity in the Public Affairs folder. Uh, so if you have Xfinity, the path is Get Local, News and Public Affairs, and then Ford Hall Forum, so you can see it for free. We will also post it um, in a couple of weeks on YouTube. So the best way to make sure that you see the video um, is to go to FordHallForum.org and click on the red YouTube button. You can subscribe to our page and you'll get an alert. Uh, if you would like to ask a question of Ms. Kristen Beck later in the program, I beseech you to approach either this microphone or this microphone, not only so the whole audience can hear you, but also so that the camera can pick your voice up. Please don't yell out from your seat. Um, and please understand that by speaking, you are giving Ford Hall Forum permission to record you. You may also tweet your questions if you are especially comfortable in your seat and you don't want to get up. Tweet your questions to hashtag FHF. That's for Ford Hall Forum, hashtag FHF. Um, and if you will take a moment now to silence your phones, that would be very much appreciated. There we go, thank you. Ford Hall Forum is proud to co-present this last event of our season with the Cass Dean's Office, that's College of Arts and Sciences here at Suffolk, and the Seminar for Freshmen program. The forum thanks its generous sponsors, including, among others, the Lowell Institute and Suffolk University. The forum also thanks our members uh, whose generosity makes our free public events possible. If you like this event, please become a member of Ford Hall Forum so that we can keep giving these great events to you. Uh, and if you're not a member yet, uh, visit the info uh, desk on the way out and get yourself a little envelope. Allow me now to introduce Alif Armbruster. Um, Associate Professor of English, Alif Armbruster, has spearheaded this event and will present Ms. Beck. Armbruster's teaching and research interests focus on American literature, women writers, and studies in the American dream. She published her first book, Domestic Biographies, in 2011, and is now working on a group biography and a study of women's captivity narr narratives. Armbruster has edited new editions of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin and Edith Wharton's novella, Summer, and has presented numerous papers at national and international conferences. She's the co-president of the New England American Studies Association and sits on the board of the 19th Century Studies Association. Please give Alif Armbruster a warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Suffolk University, and thank you so much for being here on this historic evening. We have a lot going on in Boston tonight, as I'm sure you know. I'm so very honored to introduce our guest this evening. It was only three months ago, a Sunday evening just after the start of school on September 7th, that I first heard the name Kristen Beck. As usual, my husband and I were watching CNN with Anderson Cooper, my favorite newscaster. Anderson was doing a special on a U.S. Navy SEAL who had come out as a woman after her retirement from the service in 2011. My husband and I watched Spellbound as we listened to this beautiful woman share the tragedy of growing up in a man's body, though she had always identified as a woman. What we saw on the screen that night was someone who was highly intelligent, profoundly sensitive, empathetic, and gentle. She also happened to be a national hero. What I saw that night was a true woman warrior. It just so happened that I had just begun teaching a new class this semester entitled Women Warriors. There we were watching the TV and we saw the story of a true one, a hero who had served our country for 20 years under the most extreme physical and emotional circumstances. Yet she was glowing, full of hope, committed to her life and to the cause of equality for all human beings. Chris Beck was born in the middle of five children on the lightest and brightest day of the year in June 1966. As a child, Beck moved 100 miles an hour and was a driven straight-A student. Chris played high school football, tinkled, tinkered with cars, 
and bought a motorcycle at age 17. Beck went off to college, married a woman, had two sons, and joined the Navy in 1990. In 1991, Chris was chosen to be a U.S. Naval SEAL at the age of 25. As an elite counterterrorism SEAL from 1991 to 2011, Beck went on 13 deployments, including seven combat deployments. She watched many of her friends die. She earned a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star with a V for Valor, among numerous other accolades. After her retirement, Beck came out as a woman. In spite of all that she saw and lived through as a SEAL, Kristen has said that her toughest mission yet has been becoming a woman. She was recently the subject of a CNN made, uh, well, CNN recently made a film about Kristen entitled Lady Valor, which was released on October 28th and which some of us watched earlier today. She is also working on a new memoir entitled Lady Valor. Kristen Beck is a true American hero. She epitomizes professional and personal courage as a former Navy SEAL and as an advocate for transgender rights in civilian life. She fought and continues to fight for this country and to protect the democratic way of life she believes in. Tonight, she will share her story as she continues to challenge American principles of liberty and equality on the battlefield of gender expectations. Please join me in giving Kristen Beck a warm welcome. Thank you, everyone. I'm Kristen Beck. <laughs> so the film is called Lady Valor. And uh, throughout a lot of my uh, time so far in my life, I've had a lot of people talk about valor and about courage and about all kinds of other things like that. They talk about the courage to come out and live my true self with the movie and with books and all the other stuff. And when I go on TV shows, they go, courage, 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 about living who I am. But I, I don't know, it's, it's one of those things where I say that valor and courage to describe what I'm doing right now, I don't really get it. And it makes sense a little bit, I guess, because it is kind of a difficult journey. I've, uh, I've definitely felt a lot of prejudice and I've been beaten up in the street and uh, just for living this life. But it shouldn't take that. It shouldn't take courage to just be yourself. It shouldn't be a valorous thing to just stand up for yourself and and be you, and I don't get that. And so I write under there, valor sees no gender. Courage, valor, just being yourself. It doesn't see color, it doesn't see religion, it doesn't see race, it doesn't see where you're from, your country of origin, your sexual identity, how old you are, or anything else. And that's what I'm fighting for right now, is to try to get beyond that and try to talk to people. And it should be like an educational thing. So I come around and I try to talk like this and I speak to people and just try to bring about uh, an education. Try to have like that intellectual revolution as one of uh, Elif's students earlier talked about revolution. Well, that intellectual revolution, that little spark that we need to get, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we start this thing where we can start living as ourselves and being ourselves and, and have freedom of expression and freedom of yourselves and live peacefully with each other without judgment? How do we do that? Where does that come from? That's my journey, that's my search. And I really am trying hard. Everyone is ignorant, we're just ignorant about different things. And that light of truth has to shine from somewhere. And if it's gotta be a little bit from me, then so be it. And hopefully it'll be from all of us that are sitting here today. Hopefully we can shine that light and, and get rid of some of this. That's my goal. When we're born, I'm not born with hatred. When you're a little baby, you don't know what prejudice is. When we're born, we're innocent, and we're wonderful, and we're all beautiful. We don't know what makeup is, or nose job, or boob jobs, or we don't know what the cover girl model looks like. When you're a little baby, you're beautiful, and you're wonderful, and you're innocent, and you're the best you could ever be. Where in the hell do we screw that up? That's what I'm trying to fix. Can we all go back to that innocence and that acceptance of each other? When you're a baby, you don't see color. When you're a baby, you don't know what religion is or organizations or hate or any of that stuff. Can't we all just have, go back to that time when we can grow as adults and, and be that awesome 
we can be that awesome little kid that didn't know. When I was growing up, that first time I put on a dress, one of my sister's dresses, I was just a little, little tiny kid. And yeah, my dad didn't like that too much. Football coach, Baptist, evangelical, all that other stuff. All those things that he lived and all those preconceptions and all those other things. That little kid was given a backhand and told that was wrong. So I want to go back to when I was that little kid and just have that, that wonderful time. So we all know that there's a huge uh, protest and all kinds of other things going on down in Boston Common right now, right? So what is that about? How can we get to a point when there is no judgments on either side and we can see that little spark of a human being? That's what I want to get back to. That fighter for justice and that liberty and that freedom to be yourself and be free and not worry about society's impressions or judgment or anything else. That's what I'm here for. That's what I want to talk about. Oh, on the bottom there it says bullies do see that. Bullies see all of this. And if there's a way we can fight the bullies, the only way we can fight bullies is to point at it, is for all of us at once to go, that's a bully. That's a bully. We're going to stop it. And then I'll go into my political thing and talk about voting and all that a little later also. So, so that's Chris. That was me growing up. So right there I was in high school. That's in 1982, I think. And then that was when I was growing up on a farm. And that was my dad. And uh, I think I'm down there eating cookies and goofing off or apples or something, being a goofy little kid. That was when I was in like third or fourth grade, I think, or fifth grade, somewhere in there. But that was a farm I grew up on. It was a 100-acre farm in Pennsylvania. It's uh, horses and a couple cows and some pigs. And I learned a real, real strict work ethic. And I thank my family for that, that I was able to grow up like that and really learn hard work. So before we went to school, even that young, I would be feeding the horses or out there taking care of whatever I had to do as a responsibility. And I, I don't know if we all get that. I would hope that somehow that some of the younger generation understands what the work ethic is. I don't think we all get it in the same way. But it's something that if you don't have that as an early age, you kind of miss that. So and I think that's what helped me a lot when I went into the SEALs was that growing up like that, carrying five gallon buckets of water up to the top pasture, which is about a mile away, half mile away. It was, a, it was far enough for a third grader to carry up five gallon buckets of water to feed the horses. So I appreciate my dad for teaching me that. I appreciate my dad for teaching me a lot of things. So I appreciate my mom for teaching me a lot of other things. So I, I grew up kind of cool. And I think a lot of that usually comes out a little bit in the Q&As a little bit later. I love the Q&A a lot more than me doing this because I like to hear what people are wondering, what they're thinking about. And that brings out a lot, way better stories than I could ever give you. So, at, Someone asked me later on about my mom because she's an interesting character. So after that growing up, growing up uh, religious, evangelical, uh, I don't know if anybody knows who Jerry Falwell is. So a Southern Baptist. He was, I went to that school. He was, my, uh, he was the pastor. Jonathan Falwell, his son, and I ended up in his office quite a bit because me and Jonathan were kind of buddies at the time, same grade. And uh, his dad would paddle us pretty good sometimes. So I learned uh, the spare the rod, the spoil the child was definitely something I grew up with quite vigorously. I don't know if I was a bad kid. I think I was just uh, adventurous and, and curious. And it's too bad we have to beat that curiosity out of our kids. There's got to be some other way to do that. So I don't know. I, all these things I'm trying to figure out myself, too. So I retired. That's my retirement photo right there. So I retired as a senior chief. And as you can see, all the salad, that's what they call it. So just a lot of the salad. I was around quite a bit. I spent time in Bosnia. I was uh, working with the Drina Wolves, which uh, the Drina River runs between uh, uh, Zavor uh, right on Zavornik is where I was at. And uh, I met a lot of really, really bad people. And I met a lot of really, really good people. Sometimes you couldn't figure out the difference. And that was you know, one of those big challenges I had. So I'd be sitting there in Bosnia, and I'd be working with the uh, Serbians and uh, Shlivovits and drinking their booze, because that's all they ever did. They drank a lot. And just trying to figure out where the truth is. And I'd get these whole stories from the Serbians, and I'd get all these uh, stories from the Croats, Croats. And I'd get the stories from the Bosniaks, and then the stories from the Muslim population there. 
and he knew that for a lot of years they all lived in peace. And then it all fell apart after the uh, Tito died. I don't know if anybody knows a lot of history about that region, but it's an interesting study. You, know, you can study that thing going back about 400 years and to try to figure out where it really came from. But they lived in peace for a long, long time. And so what I was doing was I was asking questions of a lot of these people from all three different sides, because I was kind of in the middle of that. And they called me, a, and I hate doing that air quotes, but sometimes it works. I was the peacekeeper. So I was there as a Joint Commission Observer working with the UN, and uh, that was a difficult, difficult thing. And as a peacekeeper, I just tried to get the story. And seeing a story from one side, and it was like, oh man, these guys are right, this is, these are, this is what's going on. And I was the Serbs. Then I went to talk to Croats, and I go, man, these guys are right, this is, this is what's happening, this is what happened, this is, what, this is where it all came from. Then I went to talk to the Bosniaks, this is, this is what's going on, this is all, this is, these guys are right. Then I went to talk to the Muslims, and I go, no, wait, these guys are right, this is, this is what's going on. And then I'm going, wait, they can't all be right. Well, where is this? And that old saying that the truth is in the middle, you know, the, who knows what it is. And I keep finding my, my entire life, I keep saying that this truth somehow, it's all, it's somewhere floating around and no one ever really gets the whole thing. None of us are right. Well, none of us are wrong. But that truth is truly, truly in the middle somewhere. And then as I'm going through this life and I was that, that bearded Viking, that man among men, that Conan the Barbarian, and now I'm kind of that Barbie-ish. I'm that, I'm that female warrior. I'm that woman warrior, as Alif was saying. I, isn't, the truth is a little middle, you know? I don't believe there is a Conan. This, whole, this guy up there doesn't exist. Sometimes this girl here doesn't exist, but I'm just floating somewhere in that middle ground, just trying to figure out who I am as a person, as a human being. And I'm still trying to find that truth. I still don't know where that truth really lies. So it's, it's my eternal search. The same thing I did in Bosnia, I was doing, again, in Afghanistan. I was still one of those, you know, trying to be a peacekeeper. I was talking to people. That's a Mujahideen commander there on the right. So he was one of the Mujahideen guys that fought the Russians for a long time. And we were over there working with those guys. And we were on their side. It was, there's, these are good guys. They're fighting a good fight against the Russians. And now I'm over there, and these guys are shooting at me. And then a few days later, I'm talking to them. And he goes, oh, yeah, you were there, you there. And I said, well, yeah, you didn't get me that time, and I'm hoping you don't get me. I'm hoping I don't get you, because you're a pretty cool guy. When I met him as a person, you were a really cool guy. And they're called Arbakai forces. That's what they're running. It's not even a Taliban. It's not anybody. And it turns out these guys are just a bunch of farmers. These guys are just people just living there. And all they do is just have a bunch of people shooting at them, so they just have to shoot back. They have to protect their families. And it was the Mujahideen and the Arbakai. That's, that's who I ended up talking to a lot. And that guy became a pretty good friend. And he was a warlord. So sitting here drinking tea with him. And I'm learning where the truth is with these guys. You know, so how can we fix this? Where do we come? Where do we fix? Where do we, where do, what happens? What's our next move? And I'm asking him this. It's just a farmer. I just want to get back to farming my land. So I was on a huge mission. And the guy we were going after was one of the guys that he said, not, maybe not that particular person, but it was some of them they were saying, this guy, is, he's running the drugs. He's the one out there harvesting the poppies and selling, you know, and making heroin and doing this and selling this stuff. He's just a drug kingpin, and he's just one of the bad guys. All right, so we'll go get him. So we're on our way to go get this guy. And uh, the mission goes bad, you know, which a lot of times they do. And so we're going into there. Stuff is happening. We're going into his bedroom. And one of his... Uh, one of his troops comes in with an AK and they're blasting and he's getting up and he's shooting and we're going in their room. It's his bedroom. His wife is jumping on the floor and then in the middle of the room there's a baby crib. It's, a, it's like an open crib with like a netting over it to keep off the bugs. And uh, the kid's standing up in the middle of the crib just crying. And so you have angry Americans running on one side of the room and angry, you know, warlord or druggies or whatever the hell they were coming on the other side and the little baby in the middle just crying. And so against all tactics and against everything I was ever taught, I uh, put my weapon down and I run in, I grab out of the crib and I grab the baby and uh, pull it out of the crib and I turn my back on as much fire as I could and then get the baby out of the room. 
And that was, I don't know, I got yelled at for that by a lot of my guys because I was putting them in danger, I put myself in danger. And I said, but I had to save that kid. It was, I had to do it. And one of the things I talk about when I go to the universities a lot was I talk about who you are as a person and what you have to do. And I always use, and it's a quote from someone, if not me, then who? And if not now, then when? If it wasn't me doing that right then, it had to be somebody had to, had to save that kid. And if it didn't happen right at that instant, who knows what would happen because there was explosions, all kinds of other crap going on in that room. If not me, then who would do it? And if not now, then when is it going to happen? And I try to live that motto pretty much every day. And that's what I was talking about in the beginning about the bullies. When you see you know, someone being bullied, or you see something going on wrong, you try to act. You have to do it. And if you do it, then there might be two or three more of the people standing up and doing it with you. And then there might be 100 people. Then there might be the entire state. And then more states, and you go, yeah, that's right. That was kind of a bully thing to do. And more states will start voting in that direction. Isn't that how we change our Constitution, our forever changing rules that we go by in this country, the Constitution and the rule of law and everything else that we stand up for? If not me, then who's going to do it? If not now, when is it going to happen? I want it to happen right now. I know I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to stand up when I see those bullies. That's my job. It was my job back then, and it's still my job today. Another story from Afghanistan. I was, uh, I was a lot of times one of the rooftop people. And uh, Afghanistan is built, they build these huge compounds and they're giant walls. The walls are probably about as tall as this right here. So what is that, like 18, 20 feet, maybe higher sometimes. And then these walls go around the entire thing. Then they build their houses, they build all the things against these walls. So they might be like a, from the top of the wall, it might be like a five foot drop off down on the roof or it might just be flat depending on how high the wall's built. So we have these ladders, and it feels just like, like the Crusades, if I can look back on it, which is kind of a bad way to look at it, because I do not want to be one of those Crusaders just fighting for religion. I want to fight for justice. So don't, I don't want to use that word. <laughs> but we put these ladders up against these walls, and we climb up on top of the buildings, and then we secure the, the entire compound from on top of these buildings. And then, uh, then we send in guys to blow up the front door, and then we come in and we take it over. So I'm going up on this roof and I'm going across and a lot of times these guys are also holding security on these rooftops. And uh, so I come across this guy and uh, he's getting up and he's rolling over towards his AK and he's picking up his AK to shoot me. And I'm, I'm already on him. So I'm holding on him, my safety's off. I'm just looking at him and I'm kind of holding on, I'm just, I'm just looking at him like that. And he's rolling over and he's bringing his AK up on me to start shooting. And just something the guy just kind of stops, and I just, I'm just i just looking at him. And I'm a pretty good shot, I'm pretty fast. I have national records and all that other stuff. So I, I know I have him whenever I want to. I can just, I can drop the hammer any, any second I want. It's not a big deal. And for something I didn't, I still wasn't shooting. I'm just sitting there holding on him, and he's just looking at me, and his eyes are all wide, and he's getting his AK, and he's swinging his AK over, and he kind of stops also, and, and he sees me looking at him. And I'm kind of like sitting there like this, just getting ready, and he knows it, and he starts putting it down. And at any other, I think any regular, per, I don't know, still the same thing going through my head. I don't know what's going through my head. I don't shoot. And I motion him to put that away and, you know, roll over. And he kind of sees, and I know a little bit of uh, posture, and so I'm talking to him. And uh, so he just kind of puts his hands up like that. And I go, okay. So I get him rolled over, and I cuff him. I put him against the wall. He's kind of chilling out. The compound's secure. We get the guy we're after, which was a bomb maker. So he had explosives all over the place. It was, he was another one of the bad guys. And uh, so I start questioning this guy, figuring out what's going on. And uh, he's just a farmer. He's up on a roof. He's just protecting his family. Again, just a, just a regular guy. Just They're getting shot at from all different directions. And I, I didn't do it. I said, OK. I'm like, all right. And so I take, all the, I take his magazine and take all the bullets out, and I give him back his gun. And all my guys are again looking at me like, what is wrong with you? And I said, I'm just talking to this guy, and he, he looks like a good guy. I'd, I'd trust him. He said, how can you do that? What's wrong with you? And I no, I trust him. This guy's a good guy. I said, we just leave him where he's at. And I give him back his gun. And everybody's still yelling at me. Just white. And I said, he has to protect his family. He's in the middle of nowhere. There's a lot of bad people out here. So just let him protect his family. He's OK. He's a good guy. So I'm walking through to shopping areas. They're called bazaars over there. So I'm walking through a bazaar about two or three weeks after that. 
after this incident. And uh, I get this guy running at me, and he's yelling at something in Pasjuni, and he's just wild-eyed and running towards me. And uh, so I'm sitting there on my pistol. I'm getting ready to pull because this guy is wild-eyed. He's running at me, yelling something. And uh, one of the interpreters was there with me, one of the locals. And he goes, no, no, he's saying thank you. He's saying something. He's, he's happy. I go, what? And so I'm still sitting there going, still kind of worried, but the guy's going, oh, my God, just doing like this. And the guy's going, thank you, thank you, it's you, it's you. And he recognizes me. It was that guy from the roof. And he's there in a bazaar, and he has a store. He's there right outside one of the American compounds, and he has a store, and uh, he sells drugs. He starts trying to, he says, come back, come back. And so I'm drinking tea with him, sitting there for like an hour, just hanging out, drinking tea, and just seeing this guy. He's talking about his family. He's showing me all his pictures of his kids and, and all this other stuff. And I was going, wow. He was just a farmer on a roof just for his family. That so happened to have this guy on the next compound, right at Jason, who was a bad guy. He goes, yeah, we knew he was bad, and we just didn't know what to do. And I said, well, he's putting your danger in, you know, your family was in danger, and this is going on. I said, this is going on all around your country. There are some bad people here. And just like in our country, there's, a, there's bad people. And they're living right next door. Well, how do you fix that? He says, well, I don't know. And I said, well, there are any more, like, right next door. There are more... The more of these guys running drugs, the more of these people doing this bad stuff. I don't want to be in your country. You don't want me here. But these guys are doing bad stuff. Let's try to fix it. So he gives me a couple of other places. He marks them on a map and says, well, this guy, he's doing this and that. I go, all right, we'll check it out. I mean, no promises, but we'll, we'll take a look. He was just a regular old good guy. He tries to give me a rug. And I go, I can't take anything. I'm like an American. So I buy one. He says, I'll give you a discount. So I got a, <laughs> I got a good discount on an Afghan rug, which sits at my house right now. But it was like, how do you, in that split second, well, I don't know what I saw. I saw that little spark in him. I saw in his eyes, and I was like, yeah, I'm not going to shoot this guy. And he knows it. He knows that I, I would have killed him just then. And so who knows what's going through that guy's head when all that was going on, or who knows what was really going through my head. But I saw the spark. I saw a human being. And maybe it was because I was dealing with those guys every day, or because, I, because 10 years earlier I was with the Bosnians and the Serbs and the and the Islamic guys there in Bosnia and all those people. And I know that the truth is in the middle, and I'm going to search for that truth. I'm going to saw that little spark in his eyes. I'm always looking for that spark. What am I doing now? So since I've come out, in the top right-hand corner, that was in a fashion magazine. It was called Flaunt. You can go to flaunt.com and see that. But I went... Pretty much from that Conan, that bearded Viking, and that man among men, he-man. And then I went to like the Barbie side. And people always talk about that. They go, well, for going from that really far extreme over here and then going all the way to this extreme here, how do you do that? You know, that huge jump. And so that's why I kind of, I can talk to people and I want to talk about that side of the Conan side. And I want to talk about that Barbie side. And I want to talk about where I am, and it's way more in the middle, and it's not really, and it's okay. And I've met people of all shapes and sizes, all colors, all religions, all the other stuff, and I keep saying all this mixture of humanity. And the real truth is we're all in the middle. None of us are really on these ends of the spectrums out of everybody I see and I meet. And I don't know if I really like that Barbie. And I don't know if I really like that Conan. I kind of like who I am right now. I'm just a real strong girl. So, and it's kind of it's kind of fun, you know, and it's kind of nice. I don't need operations, and I don't really need high, super high heels. And I don't need the short skirts and the tons of makeup, and I don't need to be on a cover of any magazines or look like that Barbie. I don't need a nose job or boob jobs and all the other stuff. I'm just gonna be a strong, kind of weird girl, and it's kind of nice. I like being in the middle. It's all right, but it's okay that I. I was did the extremes, and I found out that this is it's a way cool place to be, to just be in that gray and just be happy as yourself. We don't need to fit the stereotypes. We don't need to fit anything that everybody keeps shoving on us. There's an article they wrote about me that uh, Kristen Beck is the anti-Barbie, which I thought was one of the coolest articles, because I am kind of the anti-Barbie. I don't like Barbie. I don't like Conan either, the G.I. Joe dude. They're also, like, plastic. <laughs> well, yeah, they actually are. We're all to laugh. So go to, I go to the Capitol once in a while, and I saw White House staffers a few weeks ago about some uh, issues with health care plan. And uh, there's a bunch of us that live on the fringes, 
and the transgender population we know about the fringes. I know we're still not accepted. More than half of our country, more than half of America, if I go to work dressed like this right here, respectable, but if I go to work like I'm dressed right now, I could be fired in a spot and I have no recourse. The law is on their side. Hello, Chris, nice dress, you're fired. Nothing I can do about it. And that's half of our country, the land of the free, the home of the brave. Thanks a lot. So I go to Capitol, I live in the DC area. So I'm there a lot fighting for our rights. I'm fighting for civil rights. I'm fighting for human rights, just to be a human. I go to the Pentagon a lot. And I go to Pentagon, actually I wore this dress to the Pentagon a little while ago. I always say, I go to the Pentagon in a cute dress <laughs> with my medals. And I go, hi, General. And I'm just walking around the hallways. Hi, hi, General. How are you doing? My name is Kristen Beck. I was a Navy SEAL for 20 years. And I just talk to him. I tell him what's going on. And so I've made a lot of headway with uh, people within the Secretary of Defense about transgender people serving openly and serving, you know, how they want to serve, you know. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed a few years ago. And so you can serve in the military as lesbian, gay, or bisexual, and it's okay. It's okay on paper, but it's not okay to a lot of people still. So we understand that laws can change and policies can change, but it takes a while for society and for people to catch up. Because as babies, we're innocent. We don't have prejudices, we don't have bigotry, but we're taught a lot of that stuff. There's a lot of people within society that are taught a lot of things. And that's the stuff that I'm trying to unteach. I'm trying to let them hear stuff and hear my side of the story. And they can figure out somewhere in the middle, right? So if I can, I want to talk to a lot of people. I love talking to universities and I love coming up here. I'm just talking to y'all and just let you know where it's at. And maybe you can grab a few of these ideas and bring them home and maybe you can figure out who a transgender person is or who a Navy SEAL is or, or how about just a human being? It'll be wonderful one of these days when I can get rid of that whole transgender, I don't want to be a trans woman. I don't even want to be a woman or a man or anything. I just want to be a human being. I want to be a person. I want to be that, whatever's inside. Stop labeling me. I don't like labels. When I was in, uh, I've been to a few uh, pride parades and things like that, and I went, I actually was invited to a bunch of parades in June, because that's Pride Month, and we come out, and we wave the flag a lot. And uh, the one I accepted was to go to the Ozark Pride. It was in Springfield, Missouri. So I did that kind of on a reason. And I said, I think Boston's pretty good. You guys have a lot of acceptance. You guys are pretty progressive. You guys are pretty cool. New York City, yeah, they're pretty cool. Most of the time. Sometimes they're pretty messed up. The example is just down the street. But I just, Missouri and Oklahoma and Kansas, and there's a bunch of area in the middle there, kind of the middle of our country, that they need to see that flag flown, and they need to see people out there talking about it. And my brother and a couple of my SEAL team buddies actually said, "Why do you, you know, you're, you're transgender and you're gay or whatever you are, but why are you guys always flying that flag and you're always waving the flag and you're always so like in everybody's face? Why do you have to do that? And then I would bring that akin to what was going on with African Americans maybe back in the 60s, you know? And it's still going on today. You have to wave that flag. I have to show you who I am so at least you know who I am and you respect me. That's all I really want is a little bit of respect. Dignity and respect. So for right now, if you guys aren't doing it, then I gotta wave the flag. If I'm not waving the flag, then you won't even know I'm there. I'm just invisible. I've already been invisible long enough in my life, dang it. And so for you to see me, if I have to wave that flag, I'm gonna. And it's a flag of right now LGBT, it's a pride flag. And it's not proud to be transgender, I'm not proud to be gay, I'm not proud to be lesbian, I'm proud to be a human being. And it's a diversity flag. It's about we should be proud of each other in our diversity. No matter what color, no matter what anything, no matter what sexuality or gender, it's just, it's proud. And that's what kind of signaling right there about being in Missouri and being able to walk around like that and fly some flags and have, some, have a good time and show you who we are. Maybe you'll see that spark inside of me and maybe you won't punch me in the back of the head or shoot me because you see me as a human being. You don't see this outside cover and you see that spark, that thing inside of me. Isn't that what we all deserve? So if I gotta fly that flag a little bit right now and be a little loud, well, that's what I'm gonna do. And one of these days, 
I pray that we don't have to do that. That you just, everybody, we're just accepted for who we are as people. That's the goal. And just like that guy that was sitting up on that rooftop, I saw the spark in him. Can you see the spark in me? And how do I go from that SEAL team hero that I'd go into a bar and if somebody would see like something, a, a symbol or an emblem, and they'd buy me a beer and pat me on the back and say, thank you, and congratulations, and all this, that macho bravado and all the other stuff, and they love me. Then the next day I show up like this, and I'm getting punched. I'm getting ridiculed. I'm getting laughed at. It's the same person. It's the same human being. Because all anybody ever sees is a covering. All they ever see is what's this or this or anything else. Can we look beyond that? It's tough, it's tough to look beyond that. That's real tough. I was in Tampa. And I was just walking down the street, pretty much minding my own business. It was like 12.30 at night on a Saturday. So out there drinking a little bit. But I'm just walking down the street, and I have these four guys walking towards me. And uh, so I kind of get a little sideways, and I say, excuse me, and I just walk past them. Well, just as I'm getting past of them, they, all they see in their head is probably a dude in a dress. And one guy goes, starts going towards me, and I'm, I'm already walking away from them. They're sort of back there. And that guy goes, fag, and goes, wham and punches me right in the back of the head. So I get cold cocked, you know, straight up. It could have been a kill shot. It could easily could have killed me. And so I'm knocked out of my feet, and I'm laying on the ground. And when I'm waking up, I'm waking up to four, all four of those guys are all kicking me, just booting me. And uh, it took about a week to start walking, you know, a little, a little bit better, because it was, I got kicked pretty, pretty good. So they definitely beat me up pretty good, and they're stomping, broken ribs, and pretty, pretty, pretty well beaten up. But then I'm trying to get up, and my wig is over there, and I'm going, uh, So it was, it was a pretty bad situation. And uh, they just saw covering. They saw none of this. They saw none of this. They saw none of what you all are looking at right now. So how do you do that? How do you, can you judge somebody so quickly, not a word spoken, just pass her by on the street, and you get punched in the back of the head, knocked out, could have been killed. How do we do that to each other? This is, the, this is what I'm trying to say here. How do you go from that to an automatically with a small change to being ridiculed and punched in the back of the head and laughed at? There is something that has to change with our society or something that has to change with our country. We're a powder keg. There has to be some education. There has to be something that has to happen with some education and that peaceful intellectual revolution of spirit. And I think it has to come from a community like this. It has to come from the educated. It has to come from the colleges. Something. I'm praying for that day when we can all kind of wake up. And a lot of things that I talk about, and I talk about that spark the whole time I'm talking since I've been up here. I'm talking about that thing inside, that little, that little that spark, that inside of your eyes, who you are, I see you. I see you. But there's so much fear. There's so much darkness. There's so much ignorance. Shine a light. Help me shine a light. That's what I ask. It's dividing us and it's destroying us. And it's just too bad. Talked a little bit about the journey, about growing up about who I am as a person. Was I born in the wrong body? Because a lot of people talk about that. I don't think so. I think I was, I was born in the right body. I was born exactly how I should have been born. And now I am who I am now. And it's quite a challenge. But this is the challenge I was given. I'm gonna stand up to that challenge. And I don't know how to, if it's fixable, if, it's, if there's a right way, if there's a wrong way, if there's anything. It's a challenge when you're born with, you know, your hair is whatever, and you always have that bad hair day every day. We all have different challenges, you know? Some of us are really tall, some of us are really short. Everyone has a challenge. When I look in the mirror, and I do the same thing, and I think I do the same thing as almost every woman. A lot of men do it, I think, also, but they don't talk about it. But you're looking in the mirror and going, oh, 
and you're saying like this is wrong and this is wrong and I wish I had that and, and all I'm doing is I'm comparing it to all those magazines and I'm comparing it to all those visions in my head about what a what a woman should look like and I get I don't know if I did it when I was going this is what a man should look like and I'm going man I'm just I, I want to do more pull ups and I want to do it. so but I think we all have it but why do we do that these are challenges and I'm going to stand up to this challenge and I'm going to meet this challenge and I'm going to do the best I can. And I don't want to be that Barbie. I'm never going to look like Barbie, and I don't want to look like Barbie. I want to look exactly like I am because I'm beautiful the way I am. I'm going to meet these challenges and be as beautiful as I can with what I have. And I found that as I start having more confidence, and now as I start seeing myself and looking in the mirror and going, yeah, I am beautiful. I look pretty good. Then when I go out in the public, I do because I'm shining a little bit, or I have that confidence that people kind of see that. I'm walking around a little bit better. I'm walking around a little taller. I'm walking around a little bit confident. I'm not a victim. I'm not ugly. I'm not a bad person. I'm none of those things that they keep trying to tell me that I am. I am beautiful. I am worthy. I'm smart, and I'm kind, and I'm a good person. And then I walk around like that, and it happens. And I start being that thing. I start being that worthy, beautiful, awesome person, no matter what. That's the way I want to wake up every morning. I want to look in the mirror. I am worthy. I'm beautiful. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are wrong, but damn it, I'm beautiful. Okay, I'm good. So I have to keep kind of re retelling myself that. But try that. And when you start living that kind of spirit, you start living that happy, and you start living that good and that awesomeness, you'd be surprised. And I think if I have, have no facial surgeries, I haven't had any work done since that bearded dude you saw up there. But when you look at some of those pictures, you look at how I was even a year ago, I look a lot different. I'm not doing anything different. But yeah, maybe I am. I'm looking at myself and going, yeah, I am beautiful. I am a good person. And so my inside and the way my head is living, my body started living out also, and people see that. I haven't changed anything except the way I'm thinking. My thoughts are better. Everything's better. And then people see that. And I think that's what we need to start trying to do in a lot of different ways. And if we can fix a lot of these problems we have in our country. I'm gonna start voting more, getting our politicians up there to start knowing that this is this entire group of people and a nation, we vote on like a 15 or 17% of us actually vote. That's terrible. No wonder it's all screwed up up there. Same thing goes with you know the state legislatures, the mayors, the police commissioner, and all the other things that we can vote for. If you guys want it to change, you have to change it. Change what you think. You are beautiful. You are worthy. We are awesome. And you're going to shine like that. And when we vote for those people that are going to make the differences, then we're going to have those differences happen. But it has to start with you. If not me, who's going to do it? Ask yourself that. And if not now, when is it going to happen? So think beautiful, think awesome. Go out there and vote and make our politicians and make everybody else do the same thing. We can make our country better, but it has to come from us. Individually, each individual in here and all your friends, we can do it. We are in a great country because we can change it, but it won't happen unless you do it. It has to happen from us. Have the courage to face that fear and we can all do it ourselves. And I believe in this country, and I believe in every one of you sitting in here, and I believe in Boston, I believe in Massachusetts, I believe in New England. See where I'm going? I believe in the eastern coast, I believe in America, I believe in North America, and the Americas, and our world. I believe in all of it, but you see all these little circles of how it happens. So believe in yourself. That's the only courage that anybody could ever ask for, is believe in yourself and make those circles bigger and bigger as you can influence. If you only get out this far, that's fine. Just do the best you can. It's the only thing that anybody could ever ask for. And we have not been doing that. So I challenge you. If not me, then who? And if not now, when's it going to happen? Now we can do a little bit of questions. And if anybody ever saw the movie, Lady Valor, yeah. how many of you have seen the movie? Uh, maybe, what is that, 10? About the same amount of people that vote. So <laughs> how does that happen? But there's a movie, Lady Valor. You can go to ladyvalor.com, and you can uh, find the links to buy it. 
You can get it on iTunes and all kinds of other things. I'm not trying to sell the movie, but I am going to sell you the idea that there's a lot of documentary films out there. There's a documentary film. And uh, just to educate yourself, I would watch that movie Blackfish, which was pretty amazing. There's a, there's a ton of really cool documentary films out there. They always make those hype about the Oscars. It's always these like, movies about space and these science fiction and all. Some of those are pretty cool, though. But holy cow, that's what they, they had all the attention, all the movie stars, everybody else, all talking about all this fake crap. And I know documentaries are boring, but dang it, go out and watch a couple of documentaries, and that's another really cool way to get some knowledge. And I, you're probably sitting here in the audience, this is like the choir, but, but there's so much stuff going on in our world and so many neat things. And I just invite you to take a look at Lady Valor and learn about what being transgender is about. And there's a bunch of other films out there that the LGBT community has made that is just educational. To see what the other side is like, you'd be really surprised, I think. So ladyvalor.com, and that picture, oh, this is what I even was talking about this for. See, I get off in these weird tangents. So the photo is a clip off the, off the film. So I was out there shooting, looking all pretty, which was a stupid thing to do when you're out there running around with a gun. So I had this weird vision in my head about Laura Croft and Tomb Raider. Did not work, I am not Laura Croft. But yeah, I broke my fingernail and I got like a close up of it. And I was like, you guys. They're always like pushing this beauty and the beast thing, I think. I don't get it. The Q&A is my favorite time and I like to have it. So I try to do this thing kind of short and I just talk, give you a little bit of an idea of who I am, where I'm coming from. And hopefully that kind of invigorates some questions. The Q&A is my favorite time of all time. I like to see where you're coming from. If you don't ask me any questions, then I'm going to come into the audience and I'm going to put the microphone right in your face. They ask that you come up to these microphones, one there, one there. So if you have questions, come up to the microphones. I'm going to have a, a, a leaf that's going to come back up here. And are you coming back up? So we have moderator and answerer. I don't really like speechifying. I like Q&A and better. So please Q&A. Hey, You talked at length about one of your challenges, the, the gender challenge of, you know, dealing with Barbie uh, versus GI Joe. But there's another challenge you touched on in uh, several of your stories that I think is very interesting, and I'd like to hear you talk about it a lot more. And that's the moral challenge of acting uh, in situations to uh, respond to your own moral values versus uh, responding to the expectations of the people who are counting on you, might be your dad, uh, might be your SEAL team, it might be your, your wife and your two sons. And it's a struggle we all have to deal with as fulfilling what we feel is right for ourselves versus uh, what we feel we need to do uh, you know, to fulfill the expectations of people who count on us. And I would just add parenthetically that you know, as, as we get older, a lot of us kind of give up that trade-off and fulfill less of what we feel committed to personally and respond more uh, to the, the pressures that are on us uh, in our job or our family or what have you. And you face those and you told some wonderful stories about those and I'd like to hear just more about that. Okay, thank you. Is that good, good volume right there? So that's excellent and that could I could talk probably for an hour or two hours just on that one questioner alone. So the, the nugget of that challenge of the, of the question would be the challenges between fulfilling your own personal needs as compared to like society or as compared to your family. Every action and everything that we do as individuals, you always have to, I mean, there's that pyramid of needs of the person about survival and about you know, food and water and clothing and then your, where you live and your shelter and security. And then that last one is like self-fulfillment. The top of the pyramid is about self-fulfillment, about, uh, about what mark you leave on the world when you leave it. And it's kind of that last part of that pyramid. Way down low on there, there's survival. And so I think what we do is we, as individuals and as somebody growing up and, and how I lived, I think that my, your survival is always like at the top. It has to, you have to always survive. And many times these these questions you're bringing up or these things that I put myself through, it really was a choice between survival 
of my own self or survival of my platoon or survival of my group. So you had to act at that level just to survive. And sometimes you're able to jump up to that higher level of, of thought about self-actualization, about, about being that higher justice to a bigger cause or to something, something greater than just yourself. So that's that huge balance. And how do you, how do, you do it between your survival? So for me, it was, doing, was, was coming out as a transgender person. Was that a survival of myself or was that me self-actualization to a greater justice or a greater, that I see the prejudice, I see what's going on. And I am writing another book and that's gonna be out soon, I hope. And I go into this quite in depth in the next book. This is, I didn't have, I kind of had to come out but I didn't have to. I was in a really good job before I did all this that I'm not in any longer. So I was making a little bit more than $200,000 a year. I don't have that job anymore. And so my survival is at risk. Half of my family turned their back on me when I first came out. So that was survival was at risk. My SEAL teammates, a lot of them were turning on me to say, no, we're not dealing with this. So that survival was at risk. I put pretty much my entire life in jeopardy, my livelihood and everything by doing this. And you have to understand that pretty much every transgender person does the same thing, they have to go through that. Their survival's at risk every day, and they turn so much away. But there has to be that other self-actualization. You have to have yourself, have to live free, you have to somehow come to that next level. I had to do it, but I didn't have to. I put everything in jeopardy. There is a greater goal that I have, and there's a comic book that I'm writing that kind of alludes to that greater goal. It's about the bullies, and it's about the suicide rates amongst transgender people is somewhere between 50 and 60 percent. Transgender youth, the homelessness rate, is like four, or maybe it's 10 times greater than if you were a youth just growing up, just as a regular kid. If you're transgender, the homelessness is, is incredible. It's crazy because the parents will kick you out, because your friends will turn on you, because everything else. I already talked to you about the jobs. They had more than half the country I can go in dressed like this and I'm fired on the spot. So this is survival for a transgender person is really, really, uh, it's a bad, bad place to be. And so myself, I was seeing that and I can talk, talk to you about privilege. I'll talk to you about male privilege and everything else and I talked earlier about that, about being a female. It's just, it's tough. And being a transgender female is even, it's even a tougher world. So my survival is, I've put all that in jeopardy because I saw all this going on and I saw these kids and I saw these suicide rates and I saw the pressure and these, this, just this bad, bad world that we're growing up in. And I had to do it. And so I am trying to make something better than when I found it. I'm trying to make this world maybe a better place. If I can do it just by education, that's what I want to do. I want to talk a lot. I want to speechify a lot. Come out here and talk to you all. And maybe you'll walk away with a better sense of who that person is. When you see a transgender person, you might know that they're not, they didn't choose to be on the streets to be a sex worker. It's called survival sex. They have to do it because that's the only thing they have. You can't get a job. You can't do that. You can't do that. What's left for that person? It's not a life they choose by far shot, but it's a life they have to do just to survive. If anybody wants, just type in Google tonight. Type in survival sex, and you're going to see some horrible stories. And a lot of transgender people are forced to that. And because of the way demographics go and because of the education in America, which we know is kind of screwed up, you'll find that a lot of survival sex is to transgender women of color. And it's also the highest murder rates, the highest everything, and, and, and an amazing, hard life that a transgender women of color definitely have the, hard, the most difficult. And then being a transgender woman like myself, I'm a little bit, a little bit better, but not much. And then maybe above that would be the trans men, maybe. I think they have it a little bit better than anyone else as far as the transgender world goes. And above that, you might have some of the lesbian gay community, and then the women, and then you have men of color, and then men who are on the top of that pyramid, white men. There is a structure that you can look at. You can break the whole thing down, and it falls into education. It falls into uh, opportunities and so many other things. These are the things that I see when I was coming out and doing this. And this is why I've been so public, because I'm trying to break all these stereotypes, let people know who we are. How can you break those stereotypes? 
except through education. And so that's what I'm working on really hard. Sorry, I babble a lot. I, I have another question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so I really think that like a lot of people's you know hearts and minds can be changed. And I don't like to sort of give up on people, but one of the things that I've struggled with is I just get really angry when I hear somebody say, <laughs> when I hear someone say like a, you know, a slur or something like that. So how do you deal with that? Like as an activist, as someone that's very public, you know, with being who you are, I'm sure you've experienced a lot yep. of ignorant things, and, you know, yep. you've been assaulted. So that's mm -hmm. also really bad. But how do you get past that and still keep going and, you know, not let it sort of drag you down? Because even as someone that comes from a pretty privileged place in society, mm -hmm. you know, I still struggle with yep. getting angry. I want to like come down here and give you a hug. It's going to be okay. <laughs> But the, uh, thank you. The, uh, so as you heard, like one of the stories, I did, I've been beaten up in the street just for walking down the street. <clears throat> I get a lot of slurs. If anyone saw the film, you see that almost the entire film, my entire family is using all male pronouns. It's misgendering is what they call it. And it's just like, I, I want them to kind of grow when I was giving people a chance. I know the difference between somebody who calls me, you know, Chris and dude and him and all the other things. I'm dressed like this. I, does this look like a boy to you? That's all I can say to him. I said, this is, does this look like a boy? He's like, boys don't have boobs. And we have makeup on. I have a dress. It's a little indication, you know? And so the misgendering, I know when it's just somebody just kind of messing up, and I kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. I say, this is not a boy. This is a girl. And then they kind of get it. And then people who are doing it on purpose, and it's just like the slurs and everything else like you were talking about, you know when people are purposely doing it and just doing it to really dig and then I might kind of, a little bit of that uh, might come out a little bit. But normally it doesn't. Normally I just go, man. And I just kind of, if I get a chance to talk to him for a second, I just shake my head a little bit and I go, man, you have a long way to go. You know, and I hope that you can, you know, see who I am as a person. And I try to just use that as like an education time, just a one-on-one. -on -one. I just go, you know, as you know, the way I'm dressed, I mean, it's obvious. And you're doing it on purpose. You know, you're trying to dig. I said, but it's not going to bother me too much. I said, but it should bother you a little bit that you are so prejudiced, that you are so wrapped up in your own, your own thoughts, that you think that your dig is going to affect me at all. I said, it doesn't affect me, but it should affect you that you're that insecure with yourself. I said, I, I hope you can grow sometime. And I hope you can get past that. And that's pretty much all I can do. And I said, how else can I? I'm not going to punch the guy. I'm not going to fight back. I said, I just, I feel bad for you, man. You know, it just, it's too bad. And I get it from all sides. I get it from all walks of life. I get it from everybody. I said, across the color spectrum, across the gender spectrum, across religion is probably the worst, though. So I will say the religion is top on the, on the categories for me. Because I don't think they know any better. And it's just too bad. I hope they can grow past it, is all I can say. And I think that, luckily for me, I can be a lot more forgiving than I think a lot of people can. And I think it, because of my SEAL team training, because of that, that hard edge that I've already grown from, it's my armor. And so, and I invite that. And so I do make myself a lot more public than I think most transgender people should, probably. So I take, I have death threats every day. And I have a lot of hate coming at me verbally and through email and through mail. And uh, I take that on. I go, yeah, bring it on. Hey, world, bring it on. Give me all that. Give me that pain and suffering. Give me as much hate as you want your death threats, and you can take shots at me if you want to. I don't mind, because I'm a pretty good shot back, so don't shoot at me. It'll end up badly for you. But I, I want that to come on, because if I can take that, and I know I can take, it does break me down, though. It does wear on me. But I'm going to take as much as I can, because I don't want that teenager to have it. I don't want that person that might be in a bad situation in their life, that might be whatever age they are. People sometimes have really hard times. When you see that person on the street, you're having a bad day. But that person on the street just lost somebody in their life, and they had something else, and maybe they're right on the brink of suicide themselves, and they're having a really, really bad day. Your bad day compared to their really, really, really bad day is nothing. Mm -hmm. Smile at them and say, hey, you know, you look great in that dress, or that's, you know, I hope you have a good day, you know. Bad hair day is nothing compared to what some people go through every day in their life. So give them a break, because that person you're looking at is having the worst day of their life that you'll never see that bad. I want the bad to be on me, not to be on the teenagers. I want the bad to be on me so it's not on you. Bring it on, world, because I can take it and I want to take it because if I get all that right now and I can be public out there and educate a lot of people, that's what my job is. I have a lot of armor and I'm going to use all that armor up, 
you know, it's going to be all shot up and tattered. And when I go, I'm going to be really beat up because I want that to happen to me. I want those teenagers to have a good life. So I invite them, and hopefully I can educate them. Yeah? Hi. Sorry, you have to no. prod me and say, shut no. up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, my name is Dr. Jillian Shepard, and I work for VA Central Office in nice. Washington. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. My job there is I'm an LGBT program coordinator for VA, and um, the transgender programs are my baby. Nice. And I'm very proud of what we're doing. Um, I know we still have some challenges we need to work on. Um, we are currently offering lots of treatment for transgender mm -hmm. veterans, and we're training teams of providers all throughout the country. We have a national consultation program for any VA provider to Can be able to get consultation. Absolutely. <laughs> My point was, I, I would love if you could help us reach transgender veterans to let them know mm -hmm. what we want to offer. Okay. Um, that's great. I will help so anyway I can. Okay. You so live in D.C. now? I live in Boston. Okay. So okay. Um, maybe we can talk later. Yeah, definitely but talk after. Also, I want to hear about your mom, of okay. course. <laughs> Going back, I'm very curious now. Um, and also, I want to say thank you on behalf of all the veterans that I work with. I can't Thanks. tell you how often your name comes up in therapy sessions, in mm. consultation sessions. Mm. You are an inspiration. I know you don't want that mm. <laughs> always, but you truly are an inspiration. And thank I you. really want to thank you for taking all the hits to the armor because there are a lot of people who can't right now. Mm. And knowing that you're doing that really does help them. Mm. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> to the VA. I know the VA and the news, and you all hear about the VA and how bad they are and all. They have a tough job. So we've been at war now for a long time, long, one of the longest wars we've had in history, I think. And uh, the medical practice we have in the field hospitals over there is amazingly good. And so we're bringing back a lot more people than we ever could have in the past. And uh, they have a tough job. And I applaud the VA for the work they're doing. And uh, I'd help in any way I can. The VA provides me with all my hormones and pretty much everything up until a point. And uh, they're working through it. And uh, it's, it's hit and miss from VA to VA. And uh, just information for everybody. I've, I've spoken to a lot of VAs already. I spoke to Heinz VA in Chicago and had a really good welcome there. But uh, for the veterans out there, and I think it goes to uh, just people in general, there are so many groups out there that want to help. And there's so many hotlines and the Trevor Project for the uh, LGBT group is an amazing resource, and they're doing so much good, you know, saving lives every day. But you, every person in here, can save someone's life. And you can do that just with a smile. And you never know who it might be walking down the street. You know, just like I said earlier, it might just be you just, just giving that smile and just saying, you know, hey, have a nice day, and just smiling. And it might lift that person just that little bit that they needed, and then they make it that day, and then just them making it that day, you just saved a life. So just remember that person that you see on the street or that person sitting across from you might be having the worst day of their life. You know, you never know. Yeah. Just give them a smile. So, yes? Oh, I just want to point out that you didn't talk about your mom. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, my mom. Well, Thank but you. Also, but also, um, I just want to say you look really cute in that dress. And um, I kind of wanted to know your thoughts on, like, where you see... LGBTQ rights and human rights in general going on in the future because mm -hmm. there's a there's so much going on right now. I want to see like, do you think it's getting it's better huge. or worse or? It's getting amazingly better. We're on like an exponential uh, awakening, I think, as people. And I, I don't know if it's like the, because of the millennium's changing, we're going into like the age of Aquarius. But now we're on, we're we're things are changing. You know, there's like there ha there's gonna be like a move in our our intellectual, you know uprising of, every, of all of us. I think we're at that point. It's a powder keg, just like I said earlier, and you can see it. Something's going to happen. So I, I feel good about it. Transgender rights, I met with the Assistant Secretary of Defense just a few weeks ago, and I uh, had a good sit down. He scheduled with me 30 minutes. We went for a little over an hour. He canceled a few meetings that he had with other folks. Like the three-star general was out in his outer office waiting. 
And I, he actually called and said, hey, I need to, can you reschedule? And a three star, I can't tell the four star no, so it was pretty much done. <laughs> so I sat in there for a little over an hour and it was amazing. And at the beginning of the meeting, it was like, you know, and this is like the end of the meeting. So, you know, I was sitting across from you, know, I was kind of, it was kind of weird. And I was looking at you and I'm not really sure what to say. And, and all this conversation about how awkward everything was. And then he was like, about five minutes into it, it was just like, I was just talking to a senior chief, you know, and talking to a person and heard a lot of good things. It was like that kind of growth from someone that deep within the Pentagon was pretty amazing. And uh, if Ashton Carter gets uh, selected as the next Secretary of Defense, I've worked for him in the past. He was one of my direct bosses, so I know him pretty well. So I think that when I start, and I give up, I don't try not to give up predictions because it's a really bad thing to do, but uh, the war's gonna end in September 2nd. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> The uh, transgender rights in the military and about open service and about that is going to have a really huge thing happen about, you know, in the next few months or summertime. So, because I have some more meetings going on. And so, I'm there every day talking to people and trying to make it happen. So, education, just tell them who we are and go into the VAs. So, how my about mom. Your mom? Yeah. I know. <laughs> I, need, I need you to coach me. Talk about your mom. Okay, this is the coming out. And coming out as a human being, hi mom, I'm a human. Or coming out as gay, or coming out as a lesbian, or coming out as whatever. The coming out out of the closet, and I hate that term closet, mm -hmm. but we all live in closets. We all have to come out in our own little way. I uh, worked at the Pentagon in 2008, is when I came out to my mom. So I was at the Pentagon doing some other work. I was running some huge programs, and I was telling them what my programs were doing. My mom lives about. 40 minutes away from DC. And so I was going, hey mom, I'm gonna come over for dinner. You know, I had this big job and it's really cool. And I'm in my suit and tie, you know, meeting a lot of big guys. And uh, I was in the military, but I was usually in suit and tie or I was wearing a bakul and had my beard. So I hardly ever wore a uniform for like the last 12 years of my career. So I'm in my suit and tie, coming back from the Pentagon and uh, pull in the driveway. I'm in there, my mom's cooking dinner. She's at the thing. And I walk up and I loose my tie up and she has a glass of wine. She pours me a glass of wine. So I'm at a glass of wine. I go, hey mom, you know, it's, do you mind if I put something comfortable on? And she goes, yeah, it's just the two of us. You can put pajamas on if you want. No, no problem. And I go, some of you all know where this is going. <laughs> so I go, so I go back and this, no one knows. None of, no, no one in my family knows about any of this. And so uh, I go in the guest bedroom and I put on hose and high heels and this skirt and all this, put my wig on, get it real nice and straight and put some lipstick and other stuff on. And so I come out and hardwood floor, click, 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 just cliffing out into the floor. My mom just, she's sitting there with a glass of wine, she just looks up across her shoulder, just kind of does like that, puts the wine down, I'm still walking towards her in the kitchen. And uh, she just starts shaking her head, Christopher, you look like a hooker. <laughs> and that's all she says. <laughs> And I go, okay. She says, well, real ladies don't wear those kind of heels. And, and I go, well, some of them do. I go, she goes, well, we're just having dinner, so take those off. I go, okay. So I took the shoes off. So I'm sitting in a, and I'm like 40-something, and my skirt's pretty short. And she goes, and you should dress your age. And I said, I have it. I have it. And she goes back in her room, and she pulls out one of her dresses. I said, this one would be much better. This is like, this one at least is about knee height, and this is like that and that. And so she starts trying to like coach me through that. You have too much makeup on. You have this and that. And she says, Jesus, you don't need to do all that. And, you know, as most women don't. You know, you don't. And I go, all right. Well, thanks, Mom. And so the coming out is sometimes, yeah, maybe that's not a good way to do it. So maybe it was. I don't know. But it was just a funny thing about my mom was that the first thing she said, and then she starts coaching me and says, this is a better dress. So she started giving me some dresses and some other stuff. And we're the same shoe size. We're about the same size. It worked out pretty good. I was lucky that way. The, uh, the other comment she made, and this was in 2008, 2010, 2011. I'm out of the military in 2011. And then I come out very publicly, and I'm very, I'm very out there. Before I was out really public, I was out to my family. I said, I'm going to start living this way. So I was kind of giving them a little bit more of a warning shot than just showing up. Hi, Mom. So uh, she goes, this is just a phase. You're going to be over this. This is going to be, you're going to be done. And we're just talking. And there's more of the families out there. And she goes, Christopher, I just don't understand this. Why well, can't you be normal and just be gay? <laughs> okay, that's another great mom line. So this is in uh, 
were six months before I even had a book or anything, and the movie start, and starting to film. And she's not gonna be any part of this movie because she was like the film Lady Valor. Because she says, it's just a phase, you're gonna be over this, I don't know what you're doing, I don't get this, I don't understand. And why are you doing this? Why do you have to have a film? Because now everybody's gonna know. And what are the neighbors gonna think? And I go, ding, light bulb, what are the neighbors gonna think? And I said, oh, okay. So you're not actually thinking about me, you're thinking about yourself, what the neighbors are talking to you about, and how you feel. And you're not thinking about how I feel. And then I find that's really the thing about a lot of parents. I said, so what about how I feel and what about where I'm at? You're thinking about the neighbors, you're thinking about your friends, you're thinking about whatever else, and I'm thinking about how you raised me or did you screw up somewhere? I said, well, what about how I think? What about what I feel? Well, that doesn't matter. The neighbors are going to be upset. I just can't believe it. Why can't you be normal and just be gay? You can cover that up at least. Okay. So that went on for about a year. <clears throat> and then after the film came out, she started kind of chilling out a little bit because she saw all of it. And she saw the film in a huge audience about, about a thing about this size. It was full. And uh, then she was like, okay, I understand now. I know we've been good ever since. Because then she clicked in her head that this is not for me. This is for a lot, this is for a lot of other people, the education. And then really, this is me because she saw it. And then now I'm Chris or Kristen now. And she accepts it. And it really helps. But don't think about yourself. Don't think about the neighbors think. And don't think about... There's so many things that we think about. What about that person? What about them? What do they think? How can I make life better for you? I don't care about the neighbors. So how about that? Well, well, Next question. Yeah, well, <laughs> well thank you about your mother. Um, so as a segue, what about your sons? And how, how, what do your sons yeah. think about you? And how do you transition out with them? Because you yeah. know, f from one transgender dad to another <laughs> transgender dad mom, and how does that yeah. all work? Thank you. So transgender dad, transgender mom. So if we could be kind of some, some transgender man as I was to my kids. So I like the term mod. It's kind of like a mom and dad kind of, I always like that one, just an idea. So I'm a, tra I'm a mod, hi mod. Or dam? No, mod, <laughs> no mod's better. Okay, a little bit of humor has to be in there. So my kids I'm still having a, a tough time with. So, uh, and I talked about this earlier, and this is like a really tough subject for me. So as far as the transgender side goes, they don't really mind. They haven't really met me yet as Kristen. So I still have that struggle to go through. And it's been, it's been a long time. I talk to them a little bit on phone once in a while now, which is kind of nice, it's a huge step. They still have a problem with who I was when I was in the SEALs. So in the SEALs, I really was an angry bearded Viking. I would come back from deployment and and working at the VA, you understand this. Man, when you come back, I, and I don't know if you want to sit down for a second because this is a really good story. I'll get, here, come up here, I'll give you my seat. But, but the, uh, I flew back home in 2008, and this is back in the days when they knew me, and uh, we had some huge firefights going on. I got blown up and I was injured, and uh, I went on a couple more operations in that. I just stitched it all up, took all the shrapnel out, did the stuff, and I was bandaged up, and I was okay, and I was like, all right, well, they still need me, so I was still going out on ops. I just put a lot of extra tape on. And uh, finally, they were like, Chris, you gotta go home. As we have an airplane gone, it it's going back. I have some of our guys on it. You need to get on an airplane, you need to go back home. I was like, all right. So I'm getting on the airplane, and we were in a huge firefight just a little bit before that, and uh, the Vehicles were blown up, so I'm walking past the vehicles up on the plane, and I start getting back to the, to the front of the plane, walking that way. And it's all coffins, the whole thing is full of coffins. And uh, so I sit down in one of the jump seats, and the, it, it's all full of coffins all the way across to the other jump seats. So I'm sitting there like this far, so the coffin's like right there, American flag draped over, and it's full of them. And uh, we start flying, <clears throat> and uh, the light goes off so we can sit down, we can all lay out and we can rest. So all the guys move to the vehicles and move to the other side of the plane, away from all the, all the flags. And uh, I wrote about this in my next book and it's called Flags of Freedom. There's no way for me to lay down. So I have to lay down right there with all these flags. And uh, that's how I came home. And so we come home so many times and I came home a bunch of times, not quite like that. That was probably one of the worst. 
I still have dreams about flags that wake up with all these flags all over me, which is not a very good way to wake up to your flag. The flag means a lot to a lot of people, the flag of freedom, you know, and we really do fight for freedom. We're really trying hard. Our country's pretty messed up sometimes, but dang it, I've been to a lot of other countries, and we're a pretty darn good country. We do a lot right, a lot more right than we do wrong. But I came home really bad sometimes, and I know that I wasn't the best dad, and I didn't always do the right stuff for my kids. And they're still dealing with that person that came home on that, on that coffin full plane that I just can't get over sometimes. So I still, I'm still pretty messed up. And I'm trying to get past that. And I'm still trying to work with the kids. They accept this, they still don't, they still can't figure out that person. And I got drunk a lot back in those days because it's the only way to get rid of it, you know. And I was not a good person always. I dream about that flag and I dream about flying back like that a lot and it's hard to get past. And a lot of guys out there deal with the same things. We have, a lot of, we have a lot of ghosts, and we have a lot of things we're dealing with that a lot of people, unless you've been there, you don't, it's hard to figure out. So give those guys a break sometimes. You know, they need, they need the handshake and a smile. You see a veteran with a hat on, it has all the stuff, and they have a lot of medals and things all over it. That's the vet that you just need to say thank you to. Because that guy's wearing a hat because he wants a thank you. He wants you to know who he is. Because he fought for that. I've had so many guys die at my side, and so many guys I've seen blown up and blown in half, and all the stuff that I've gone through. Those guys did too. Those guys that are wearing a hat, they're doing it on purpose because they want someone to just shake their hand and say thank you. They get one of those, they might live another day. They get one thank you from somebody that just off the street. They're looking for it. That's why they're wearing a hat. They're not wearing a hat, pumping their chest, or talking and waving a flag. They're wearing a hat because they need somebody to say, You are worthy. Thank you. We appreciate what you did. So you never know how they came back on that airplane. So kids are dealing with something else. Sorry. I'm glad you sat down. <laughs> we have five minutes. I can do this all night. Sorry. Oh, this is fairly quick. Just want to say there is hope. Um, four years ago, I met Misha. I, I see people, I think, the way you want people to see them. I see them almost in terms of energy. Do they have good energy or bad? And Misha glowed as Misha. Uh -huh. And we, we got married three years ago. Oh, congratulations. We now. Um, yeah. My two kids, I brought them up. Probably sounds weird, but to be more like my dog than people. Oh, that's so awesome. Because they come up and they judge people. They don't judge people. They come up and they feel them. And they were so happy to meet Misha, and they've yeah. taken Misha into their lives. Their partners That's have awesome. taken them, taken Misha into their lives. My son's a drummer in a rock band. They think Misha's the coolest person on the planet. <laughs> Unfortunately, they live in Calgary. <laughs> We've moved a long way from there. But there's hope for the future. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. I, too, met somebody. I have a girlfriend now who is awesome, and she sees me for who I am. So that's so wonderful. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, yes. Kristen. Thank you so Thank you. much. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, we have a Massachusetts Turnpike, and there's a sign about uh, the 50,000-plus people that have been killed by handguns since yeah. Newtown. You know, and the, it's yeah. like the national debt where it keeps going up. Yeah. Or, anyway, um, I want your personal opinion on gun control and you know, comments about that you know, as an American yeah. and a peacekeeper. So you want my thoughts on gun control is uh, I'm running for office soon. And so should I answer this like a human being or like a politician? I can answer it, I can answer it for me. So my personal opinion is that uh, I used to be a biker. And uh, the big beard, and biker, and leather jacket, and patches, and all that. And uh, there was this one particular bar in San Diego. It was, it was owned by the Hells Angels. And uh, I'll tell you what, the safest bar you could ever go into in your entire life would be the Hells Angels bar. Because everybody in there is caring, everybody in there is a tough guy, everybody in there is, it's respect. And right now I think that nationally we don't have a respect for each other. We don't respect human life for a lot of people. And I don't know if it's like a, and it, I blame it a little bit on gangs, it's criminals, but it's also other people. Sometimes it's school teachers, sometimes it's the garbage man. It's throughout all walks of life. It's just a general respect for life, and we lose that. 
Because you look at that other person, you just go, what can I get out of that person? What can I, what, you know, just, we lose it. And so how do we get that respect back? And the reason I can be inside of that bar is because everybody has that, that deep respect because you know that if you screw up or you disrespect somebody or if you bump into somebody and say, hey, what the fuck? Well, you're going to get socked in the mouth. You're going to get a bullet in your face. And so everybody's walking around. We're all walking. We're all like, all right, respect, 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 respect. But you don't have that in society. We don't have that in general America. To have that mutual respect, what do we all have to be carrying? That's one way to do it. If everybody was carrying it, everybody would be like, oh, well, that person's probably carrying it. I better not disrespect them. I better be cool. I can't rob that person. I can't mug them because they probably have a gun. So I have to have respect. I have to walk by that person and go, hey, have a nice day. Even though you might not like that person, even though you might want to rob them, you might want to mug them, you probably don't because you're worried survival. So how do we get a respect back and how do we get everybody to start looking at each other and not being such freaking jerks to each other? So either we all have to carry or we have to educate somehow different to, I don't, I don't know. I want to know the answer too. But right now, the only way I can think of it is to have a lot of people, good, the good law-abiding citizens, that if I'd have to question myself and go, well, you know, the concealed weapons permits are about 20% in this city. If I go to Texas, damn, almost everybody here is carrying, so I better be pretty cool. But if I go somewhere else, man, nobody here carries, so I have a good chance that if I mug that person, probably a pretty good chance I could probably live. I'm going to get away with it. Because there are bad people out there. There's people out there that want to prey on the weak and the innocent. So you have to kind of juggle in your head, where's the right line? Where's the fine line? If we criminalize the guns, only criminals are going to have them. And I really truly believe that. If I'm a criminal, I'm going to have a gun no matter what. I don't care because your laws don't affect, they don't affect me. What are the chances of me getting caught? So there has to be a fine line. I do think that we should have a lot of per concealed permits out there. And I think that the more of them we have out there for those law-abiding citizens, a lot of deep, deep background checks to make sure there's the right people to have them. And then you make a lot of those criminals question the fact that, well, if I do this, there's going to be somebody here that has a gun. This group right here, you know, if you're giving out a lot of permits, maybe 10% of the people in here have a gun. So if I start doing something in this theater, it's a good chance of me getting shot. So maybe I shouldn't do it. I'm going to do it, some, I'm going to do it someplace else. You have to make them question their head because the respect is not coming naturally. So you have to make them do it some other way. So how do we do it? Except making them think about it, making them question the fact that somebody in here has a gun. So if I start doing something really bad, somebody in here is going to get me. I'm going to die if I do something stupid. It's the only thing that's going to do it. We don't, it's respect. So I don't know the answer right now, and I think it has to come with education. It has to come from the schools, and it has to start at a young age, junior high, to teach them respect. It has to be on the playground. Right now, they're not getting it. They don't respect each other. When I was growing up on the playground, you did something stupid, you're getting socked, you're getting beat up. We're not allowed to do that anymore. So I don't know how to do it. I know when I grew up, the older kids, if I did something dumb, if I was a bully, the older kids would have been beating me up. If I saw a bully, I was beating them up or I was trying, or a bunch of us were ganging up on them and beating them up. And the teachers kind of, they didn't let us do it, but they didn't really, we were never punished for it. The kids nowadays, have, they don't respect, they don't have that level of respect. They're fearless. They don't have any recourses. There's no punishment. It's all carrots. So I believe in gun control, that we should have a certain amount of concealed weapon permits with a deep background checks. We should open it up a lot more than what a lot, of, a lot of the cities are doing right now. I believe in it. I believe that all, a lot of us should be carrying right now. In this room right here, there should be six or seven guns probably in this room right here. It's the only way to fix it. And then hopefully we can dial it down a little bit. So. Hi there. Dang, we're going to leave the last question as like no. a gun control question. I know. Well, I'm going to well, run the for first office. thing is we've I'm got, run for office sometime. We got four more minutes, so you can wrap it up. And the okay. second thing is there better not be six or seven guns in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question. Anybody have a question? Dang. See, I'm never going to be able to make office. Michaela. People yelling at me about guns. Michaela has a question. <laughs> I don't know your laws. <laughs> Uh, hi, first I'd like to say thank you for your service and for your activism and helping 
create transgender equality. Uh, my question for you is, uh, you talked about how the suicide rates for transgender people are about 50, 60 percent. What advice would you give to transgender teenagers who are suffering from, you know, who aren't able to really deal with their feelings about their gender identification and mm -hmm. who are having trouble um, feeling like they belong and may have suicidal feelings? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, there's a, that's a great question. Thank you. And uh, there's so much information out there. And luckily for, for the generations now and for people coming out right now, you guys do have the internet. You have a lot of ways to do it on social media and other things. But just f you having your friends, and you sound like you're probably like a really good friend of somebody who uh, is probably transgender. And that's, that's like the greatest thing you can have as a friend. So you're probably saving lives right now just by being a great ally and being a good friend. And that's where it comes from. It's like the family, then your friends, and then other people who are acquaintances, and then the rest of society. You can affect your family greatly. And that's what there's a, I've been to Utah quite a bit, Salt Lake City, because that is the highest uh, LGBT homeless youth in the country. It's pretty bad. And I blame that a lot on the church. And uh, so I go there and I give money to youth groups and I try to help out. And I've been there like four or five times. So I volunteered. I just buy my own plane ticket and fly out there and go to meetings. But uh, that's probably where all my money's going, dang it. <laughs> but uh, just helping out. And you can do that individually, and we can all do it individually. This is when you see somebody like that and just helping them, and you know. And the kids growing up now in education, and try to tweet something when you see something cool out there, good, and let people know that, yeah, I support it. Because they're all watching it. All those kids out there and all, those other, all the other transgender people, we're watching the boards, and we do the, we do the uh, pound sign, or no, hashtag. Now I gave away my age. <laughs> so we do pound sign transgender or trans, and we do, we do hashtags, and we look for it. And so as a younger kid, they're going to look for the stuff and try to find it. So the more you can be supporting, the more supportive you can be in the social media world and also in the real life world, it really helps. And then for all those kids out there, the Trevor Project, and there's a whole bunch of other things, you can look it up. Just Google it and take a look at it. So I Google it a lot. So it's... <laughs> Trying to lighten it up for the last thing. But the, uh, there's so much information out there. Just keep doing what you're doing. I mean, I know by the question you asked that you're doing a great job. But pass it on to your other friends and, and try to build up a social presence. And uh, I'm the Lady Valor on my Twitter account and all my other stuff. And so the more support that you can give and all the other folks out there can give to some of the activists. And I'm a trans activist. I'm a civil rights activist. And there's a whole ton of other smaller minority group that have activists. The more we can get support, the more you support them, the better it makes it all kind of bigger and bigger. And the more support you show just that way is huge. So just be a friend. That's the only thing you can do. So, and the more friends that they can see that are supporting them, the happier they'll be. And you'll see a really cool person grow out of that. So thank you for supporting your friend. It means so much. So thank you to everybody. This was awesome. Thank you. I should let you close. Do you want to close? Well, Closing comments from the professor. No, I was just going to thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming out, and um, I hope you enjoyed the evening. And feel free to stay for a few minutes afterwards if you'd like to meet Kristen personally. Thank you so photos much. Photos and whatever else you want, um, whatever you need. <laughs> if you want to do photos, I'll be over here. <laughs>